Thank you very much. That's the most amazing introduction I've ever received. Nobody's made me out to be the natural successor of Joseph Conrad before. That's remarkable. Thank you very, very much. Now, can everybody hear me? Can everyone understand me with my really thick British accent? Good. Okay, this is, this is good. We're off to a good start. Now, welcome to speculative fiction. Now, I imagine that quite a lot of people booked this session, arrived at this session, and sort of went, what actually is speculative fiction? Don't worry, I did that too. I had to look it up. Now, we really love boxing books into different types, don't we? In fact, we love it so much that instead of saying types, we say genres because that is French and therefore cool. Now, we drive... We divide stories uh, into these genres, often very strictly, because we have to put them on a shelf in a bookshop, right? We have crime, we have historical fiction, we have fantasy, science fiction. And the more books people write, the more ways we, we come up with in order to define them. To the point that we do it a bit much, right? Sometimes you hear somebody say, oh, I really adore gothic, steampunk, cosmic horror, and everybody feels very confused. Speculative fiction is a lovely broad term that covers a lot. We're talking about science fiction, fantasy, anything weird or strange from fairy tales right up to stories set in space. So all the good stuff, basically. We've finally come up with a label for the good stuff. Welcome to the good stuff. So what is speculative fiction actually for? Now, I know that that's a peculiar question to ask. Uh, but it's useful to ask it. It's always worth thinking about the function of genres in storytelling. It stops you turning into one of those very solemn people who try to convince everybody that the only worthwhile books are the painstakingly realistic ones about middle-aged people having a terrible time in dull houses written by middle-aged people having a terrible time in dull houses. Now, I, if I read one more of those, I am going to hurl myself out of that window. I really am. And that's not because I'm ignorant or because I'm stupid. It's because the function of those books is something that I don't require at the moment. Usually those books, the focus of those books is prose. It's the poetry of the language, the style, the rhythm, like beautiful storytelling. And of course you can convert the dullest, lowest story arc into something absolutely gorgeous with enough poetic language. I think about something like Mrs. Dalloway. You can summarize that book in one line, woman throws a party, so what? But the story isn't the point of that novel at all. As Virginia Woolf says, the point is to watch the atoms landing on Clarissa Dalloway's mind. Amazing, but I'm quite a restless person. There are plenty of atoms on my mind. I don't need anyone else's atoms, thank you. I'm fine with mine. I think a lot of the time, that's often something we forget in fiction writing. That genre basically describes a function. Music is really good at doing this very openly, I think. Amazon and YouTube and Spotify allow you to create playlists that cater to your mood, right? So if you want to feel cheerful, you listen to dance music. And if you want to kill yourself, you listen to the Spice Girls. But of course, we all do that in bookshops as well, I think. We do it when we browse online. We perceive genre titles as a kind of code. And often when we see a section that says, ah, oh, literary fiction, what we really read in our brains is, ah, oh, lovely, beautiful, calming things. And often when we see crime, we, see, we really kind of translate that into something more like hugely depressing but makes you feel rather smug for not having been murdered behind the bins. This is all great. And of course, when we look at horror, if somebody says, oh, I really love horror, you don't love horror. You love the feeling of being safe and cozy while pretend peril is going on over here. I love horror in the same way that I love being inside in the most almighty thunderstorm. It's exactly the same feeling for me. So I think the point of speculative fiction, its function, is the showcasing of imagination. It is a celebration not just of our ability to observe what is, 
but also our ability to observe what isn't, what could be, what could have been, what never will be, what is impossible. It is the way that we reach past, right here, right now, past those laws of history and physics. So why in the world is it so important to do that? Why do people like me come at you and say, I don't care about James Joyce or Ulysses, I really want you to read Margaret Atwood. There are two huge reasons. I will come to the second one in due time. You will believe that I have forgotten about it, but I won't have. It's just that reason one is really long. Even when everything is basically okay in the world, we need a way out, don't we? We need a way to escape. Life is an awful lot about Microsoft Office and spreadsheets and falling out with people at the office about who stole the good teacup. That isn't unbearable. Of course it's not. But it's not really that good for the soul either. But all the statistics suggest that dragons absolutely are good for your soul. According to HBO, 17.4 million people watched the premiere of season eight of Game of Thrones. Now that is something I find fascinating. High fantasy, that kind of that sword and sorcery and wizards and magical priestesses and dragons, that kind of fiction was not fashionable before season one of Game of Thrones came out. Lord of the Rings, of course, had its following. The films were huge, the books were huge. We all know that Tolkien is kind of the grandfather of modern fantasy. But there was never a fantasy book that everyone knew. It wasn't a water cooler subject. It wasn't something where people yelled at you not to give them spoilers if you had watched it before they had. So something's going on here. What is it about big, weird, mythical things that got to people in Game of Thrones, in spite of the idea that I think a lot of us share that fantasy is basically for geeks? The idea is doing something for us. It has a function. Now, I think when we're talking about this, it's worth looking at other places in fiction where something vast and mythical has really touched people, has really had an effect. And we talk about Tolkien when we talk about dragons and magic, but Tolkien did not come along one day and invent mythic cycles and high fantasy. Of course he didn't. I think before Tolkien, the crown was the unpleasant but very interesting head of H.P. Lovecraft. How many people have heard of H.P. Lovecraft? A few, let me tell you about H.P. Lovecraft. Now, his most famous short story begins like this. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. Good God. That there was a frightened man, as you can tell. But what he wrote was really extraordinary. The story from which I took that first line is called The Call of Cthulhu. I really str struggled to spell that and say it. You will as well. Look it up. It's weird. At the beginning of the story, though, all over America, artists and writers and other people of a philosophical mindset start to dream these bizarre visions of a place full of wrong angles and ancient texts in a forgotten language. And they start to get this deep, pervading sense that something is coming. And then, not long after, a small group of sailors stumbles over an island that has recently risen from the sea in the wake of an undersea earthquake. And what they find there is ancient ruins, ancient languages hewn onto the walls. And it was clearly built by things that are not human. And underneath it, somewhere, Something is sleeping. I know. Isn't it cool? Now, H.P. Lovecraft was, as you have noticed, a scared man. He was scared of women. He was scared of foreigners. And I suspect scared of fish. His stories are full of fear. So much that they've actually been labeled cosmic horror. Which I kind of expect, right, from monster stories. You expect to be scared and frightened of monsters. But that is not usually the case, is it, with monster stories? If we look outside of written fiction and into folklore, 
we see a very different attitude. In Scotland, even today, local folklore says that there is a strange creature that lives in a very deep black lake there, and that lake is called Loch Ness. All over America, Native American tribes from various different cultures and various different regions talk about similar monsters, these huge water beasts with long necks and horrifying appetites who sometimes steal human children. In Chinese and Japanese fairy tales, there's nearly a dragon for every princess. How many of you came from Kowloon today? Anyone? A few? Great. Kowloon, nine dragons. It's the hills, right? It's the hills in Kowloon, the, the nine dragons. Except someone looked at that and didn't go, yeah, let's call it the nine hills. Someone went, yeah, I reckon dragons. Dragons are everywhere. What I find really interesting in these stories, and even in the very oldest ones, is that they're not like other fairy tales. Usually, fairy tales have a very obvious point to make, don't they? Usually, they warn you about the danger of something. Red Riding Hood is the best example of it. Red Riding Hood is about how young girls should be very careful about walking alone in the woods dressed in red, because there might be wolves, or worse, there might be men. <laughs> but, well, where have I got to? Yes, Beauty and the Beast, meanwhile, it shows you how monstrous someone can become when they're subjected to enough loneliness and bitterness. But very, very few of our beast stories, the ones about the dragons, the wild things, the forgotten creatures in the sea, very few of those are about stopping your kids going to the dark water. If you visit Scotland now and you speak to people and you ask them about the Loch Ness Monster, which is what their, their monster is called, they don't tell you not to go to Loch Ness in case you're eaten. They tell you to go in case you see it. We all want to see it. And this is extraordinary. This is not a normal fairy story. Usually fairy stories warn you away. They don't pull you in. So this is different. If we're, it's this longing we have for something vast and great and vanishing. We love to think that there is more in the world than we know. And that's one of my favorite things about human beings. We hate knowing everything. So why is that? I mean, humans spend so much of our time making charts and tables with diagrams and formulae on them and pinning those things down with observable truth as accurately as possible. We ought to hate the idea of stuff we don't know or can't explain. But I think it's because we're analytical. We like mysteries to solve, don't we? I think the main thing is this. Life would be rubbish if we knew everything. Nobody would have anything left to do. People think that they want to sit around in a lovely flowery meadow and have a picnic, but they don't. They want to do that for one afternoon, and then they want to get up and do some work and be something useful, because we are basically useful things, humans. What we really want are things to puzzle over and think about and mysteries to solve, preferably impossible mysteries, mysteries that last down the generations. And that's important, the age of those mysteries, because it means that not any old nonsense will do. I can't just invent like a weird elephant-parrot hybrid and expect that to have any power in a story. It wouldn't, it would just be odd. For something to have that amazing mythic tug at our mystery-loving organs, we have to recognize it but not know it. What we need is dragons. Now, by the way, if you ever find yourself really struggling to defend science fiction, fantasy, speculative fiction as a whole to someone who thinks it's kind of geeky and stupid, please know that you are not alone. We all have to defend it at some point. How many of you know Lord of the Rings? Films, books, whatever. Yeah, Lord of the Rings people? Admit it, admit it. Okay, good, a fair few. Now, before he wrote that, J.R.R. Tolkien was a professor at Oxford University, and he studied Old English. How many of you have been forced to learn or read or anything in Old English? A few, yes, the unlucky few. So Old English is not really, really old, but it is a very different form of English, actually. It's nearly German. It takes you ages to learn it, and it's really dull, and there's not very much written in it. But there is one brilliant thing written in Old English. And it's a huge, amazing, epic poem called Beowulf. And Tolkien spent an awful lot of his time 
uh, reading this, studying this. Now, it's a wonderful piece of fiction. It's one of the oldest poems to exist in English. It's from the 8th century AD. It's a huge epic about a man who rises to fame fighting a monster called Grendel, and then many years later falls fighting a dragon. And it's brilliant, but when Tolkien was studying it, a lot of academics really hated it. As I said, it's from the 8th century AD. So this is kind of mud hut territory in England. And people have been living in the broken ruins of the Roman Empire in the middle of one of the most catastrophic losses of technology that Europe has ever seen. Academics at the time really wanted to say that because the people who wrote it were primitive, the poem must be primitive as well. To add to that, it was often viewed with as a kind of historical document, much more than a piece of literature. And so naturally, a lot of scholars were a bit annoyed that rather than focusing on politics and on daily life, which would have been really useful to them, it's about monsters. Now, that is a criticism that is often leveled at all kinds of historical fiction. Why are you messing about with dragons? We want specifics. We want real things. We want historical figures and facts. But Tolkien said something in a wonderful essay that nobody else did at the time. He said, it is an enhancement and not a detraction. In fact, it is necessary that Beowulf's final foe should not be some Swedish prince or treacherous friend, but a dragon. And I think he's completely right. A dragon is a universal symbol. In all the centuries that have passed since the writing of this story, we still understand that a dragon means something mighty and inhuman, a worthy foe, in other words. If Beowulf had fought some contemporary enemy, a real Viking or whoever, we'd have no idea who that was now. But we know dragons, because dragons are ageless. So, I think actual dragons are getting toward the end of their storytelling usefulness. They've kind of been overdone, haven't they, uh, since Tolkien. There's Game of Thrones, there's Harry Potter, there's How to Train Your Dragon, even. Enough. But there are plenty of other strange and monstrous things. So bring it on. Now, I said at the start, didn't I, that I suspect that speculative fiction has two functions. I didn't forget. You thought I did, but I didn't. I think speculative fiction, rather like Star Wars, has a light side and a dark. The light is this ability to say, what if all this wonderful stuff were true? But the dark, of course, is what if it all goes to hell? This distinction is so clear that we even have a name for the what if it all goes to hell branch, don't we? Dystopia. Now, dystopia is not, I would suggest, just about depressing everybody. We've been talking about function, and I think dystopia has one of the most important functions in all of literature. It is our early warning system. And I think dystopia um, is the way that we culturally recognize the shit before it hits the fan. It's how we know when to put up the umbrella. Knowing history is all well and good, but people usually remember stories a lot better than they remember exactly the political situation of Germany in 1936. I think now, more than ever before in history, it is vital for us to be able to express huge ideas in shorthand. The Twitter character limit is really short. Instagram is short. Facebook status updates are short. An awful lot of the ways we communicate with each other casually is a sentence or less, isn't it? And of course, one of the most insidious things about the rise of the far right is that arguing with it normally takes more than a sentence. Calling out kind of this foul abortion legislation in Alabama requires an essay. Proving that Donald Trump is running concentration camps requires a long newspaper article with an interview with a medic who was there. You can't just yell boo or you'll sound like a moron. So what do you do? You can't do all that explaining on Twitter and you can't do all that explaining in the five seconds that you have as a newspaper, as a news camera pans across you. But fortunately, we have this wonderful shorthand available to us. Instead of writing at length about scarily invasive social media, monitoring, security monitoring, any of it, all you have to say is Big Brother is watching. 
We all know that that's from 1984. We all know Orwell. And we know that that contains a whole novel's worth of context and meaning. When people went to protest the Alabama abortion legislation, they didn't have to say anything because they dressed as handmaids. Now, anyone who has read or seen or even heard of The Handmaid's Tale knows what that is, and they know how chilling it is that this is the statement that these women are making. Likewise, if we ever see governments stacking things hugely against normal people, we don't have to write an essay about it. You just have to go... <laughs> you remember this? Or even say, may the odds be ever in your favour. We know The Hunger Games. So, at its very simplest, and perhaps its most effective level, dystopia gives us the language and a system of reference with which to recognize and express the nasty stuff quickly. Now, speed aside, a dystopia novel is also one of the most efficient ways to show how things are already wrong without the need for a, a stack of essays. And I saw this firsthand really recently. I really want to tell you about this because it knocked me sideways. So, my mum was born in the 1950s into what I would call quite an extremely religious Christian household. She and her brother were not allowed to play outside on Sundays. They weren't allowed to have friends around. They weren't really allowed to talk, just sit and read. Their father was at the top of the family. Patriarchy was alive and well at this point. And my grandmother, so my mum's mother, she had an amazing job. She was a highly trained medical secretary. She could write anything, any medical jargon in shorthand, almost faster than you were saying it. It's freaky, and she can still do it, even though she's 90. This was a hugely qualified and amazing job. Now, my grandfather referred to this as her little job. So this is how my mum grew up. Anyway, fast forward, she's 60 now. And she really struggles with getting to grips with kind of modern gender stuff because of this. She went into a very quiet but very extreme internal meltdown when she realized that my brother was gay. And she often falls into thinking that women and gay men are kind of genetically mild while straight men are genetically bastards. <laughs> so we were talking about this and eventually I did something I mean we talked about this for years on and off whenever we're on a long journey we always get onto but Natasha what does gender mean so we were talking about this and eventually I did something that I would never normally do I sort of elbowed her and I went hey mum there's a book about all this a novel it's called The Power by Naomi Alderman now The Power which is the title of the novel is about what would happen if Overnight, women became physically stronger than men. In the book, they developed the ability to deliver a, a lethal electric shock just by touching someone. Now, the novel is, is genius. It examines all the stuff that would change from the age of news anchors right up to kind of these huge fluxes in world politics. It's very, very clever, and I urge you to read it because it's much more fun than The Handmaid's Tale. And, oh, my God... The towering, repressed rage that burst out of my mother two days later was terrifying. Suddenly, she doesn't give a damn about what my rather weird and slightly abusive father thinks about anything. Suddenly, we have a new kitchen. Suddenly, we're going on a cruise without him. What? Suddenly and instantly, her relationship with my brother improves tenfold. Now, this was hugely irritating for me because I think I'm quite clever, and I hadn't been able to make her see this for years. I now dislike Naomi Alderman uh, very intensely in an unfair personal way. But this is good. This is good. It's all good. This is why we need speculative fiction. Most of us in here write, I should think, or you've tried, or you're very embarrassed about it, and you hide it from everybody, but you do do it on sticky notes when nobody's looking. You've all written some kind of fan fiction, right? You've all watched Lord of the Rings or Sherlock Holmes and gone, I could definitely have come up with a better ending. Off I go. This is how we all start. This is the great secret. Everyone starts by writing fan fiction. I'll come back to that in a minute. But, okay. The worst... Okay. What we want to know, right, is, okay, we're here. We're talking about speculative fiction. How do you do it then? How do you go away and write this stuff? It's massive fun, but it's very easy to get it wrong, isn't it? You've, it's very easy to go, yay, dragons, oh, it's rubbish. What do you need to do? 
I said at the start that I think the basic function of speculative fiction is to showcase imagination. So what you do is you go away and you imagine. The worst piece of writing advice I was ever given is, write what you know, Natasha. Bugger off. <laughs> write what I know? At the time I was told that, I was 23 and I was living in Norfolk. Those of you who have not been to England, Norfolk is a very, very flat area, famous for beer and inbreeding. <laughs> yeah, great. I didn't know anything yet. I was 23, I lived in Norfolk. What idiot says that to someone? Write what you know. If you write what you know, you end up writing the worst sort of navel-gazing, inward-turning, pretentious autobiography. Do not write what you know. Write what you can find out. Write about people you are not. Write about the places where you were not brought up. If you're a woman, the best thing you can do right now is start a story from the point of view of a man. If you're a man, write a story from the point of view of a, of a woman. Not a woman character, the point of view of a woman. It's different. If you're young, write about someone older. And if you're white, have a stab at writing somebody who is not white. These things aren't just for speculative fiction, but they start you off. Once you learn to imagine away from yourself, it's easier to imagine away from the time and the place that you live as well. You're a man writing about a woman? Great. Now set it in 2025. Get those gears going. If you're a 30-year-old businesswoman living in Hong Kong, it takes no imagination whatsoever to write about a 30-year-old businesswoman living in Hong Kong. That is lazy. Don't do it. Writers have one great moral duty, I think, and that is empathy. Get out there and empathize. I order you. Think about, what if I were a man? What if I lived in an England that had been conquered by Russia? What if I lived in 2065? Once you can do that, once you've got all the muscles that you need, you can say, right, what if there were dragons? And that's the hardest thing to do. So that's kind of the prepared section of the whole speech. But what I want to talk about now is, well, what did I then go away and do? How did I go from being 23 and stupid, living in the inbreeding capital of England, to actually writing novels? How does that actually happen? Now, I would say very painfully is how it happens. <laughs> It's quite difficult to be a writer for a living, partly because very, very, it, it's almost impossible financially. To give you an idea, um, the average writer in the UK earns £6,000 a year, which is less than half of what you need to live. And that's not even in London, that's just to live anywhere. So this is the baseline from which you start. And this is why an awful lot of creative writing courses and qualifications do monger. They say, nope. You shouldn't be even thinking about doing this. You're going to live in your mum's spare room for the rest of your life, and you will die alone before you're eaten by cats. They really, pe people really discourage you from trying to be a writer. Do not listen to those people. It's always a good idea, because you can always do something else on the side. For those of you who are interested in writing, something that I think you really should consider is don't expect to be able to do it all the time. Writing is like running. You can only do it for about four hours before you collapse. You really can. My productive writing day is about four hours long. For the rest of the day, I just turn into a monkey and I just stare at a TV screen. Like, this, this is honestly true. But the, the kind of difficulty with the four-hour day thing is I don't know when those four hours will be. It might be at two in the morning. That might be when it starts. I might stare the whole day at a computer screen going, I wonder if I should move this comma, and then I won't write anything till two in the morning. This is hugely annoying. So be prepared for that. But don't let anyone say you can't have a job and be a writer at the same time. Don't let anyone say you're not a real writer if you do something else for a living. Of course you're a real writer. It's just very difficult to do it as a job. That doesn't mean you're not still in your soul a writer. It doesn't mean you're not writing. So the process for me was go to a really good university, and then go to another really good university. The first one was on purpose. The second one I got into by accident. It turns out that it's a really good course at the University of East Anglia. Um, but I applied because it was really near my mum's house. 
Only when I got there did I realise that it was full of agents and publishers and all this good stuff. I was signed by Bloomsbury two years later um, because I just met the right people at the right time. Bloomsbury is a big publishing house in the UK. They published Harry Potter. Um, they published Margaret Atwood, all sorts of things. But this is actually only the beginning, and I think a lot of people think, okay, well, what do you, like, you, surely you've made it once you're signed. Absolutely not. I think your life as a writer starts after you publish your first book. The reason I say this is that you're very skittish when you publish a first book, very skittish indeed. And it wasn't until I'd finished the first book that I sat back and I went, right, what do I need to find out now? And that question, what do I need to find out, that can draw you away, make you do really quite interesting things. My first book was written while I was living in Japan. Um, I was on a wonderful scholarship, and I was learning Japanese, and I poured that into the novel, and it made lots of sense, and that was great. The second book, though, I wanted to do something really different. I started to write about Peru. I didn't know anything about Peru whatsoever. Great, write what you can find out. So I started to find out about Peru. Absolutely buried myself in journal articles. And something that just happened across my desk one day was a really, really boring monograph. It was a scientific research thing written by a strange little man called Clements Markham. And it was a report for the Royal Geographic Society. This is very boring in London. And it was about an expedition that he'd gone on to Peru to try and steal a particular plant from the highlands. This plant was quinine. Quinine, in the 1850s, was the only known treatment for malaria. And it was getting really important, because in the 1850s, there was a huge malaria outbreak in India. People were dying everywhere. And the consequence was people fled the tea plantations. And of course, tea was one of the largest exports of India and therefore the British government, because being the British government, we owned India. This is not something I'm proud of. People are falling ill in India. Now, to give you some idea of how important this is, it was something like up to 90% of the revenue of the British government that was generated by tea. That's insane, isn't it? There was an awful lot of tea per head in the days of the British Empire. People were absolutely obsessed with tea. So this was a huge financial loss huge. But the difficulty was that the treatment for this terrible illness was very, very rare. It only grew on a particular tree that grew at a particular altitude in a particular part of the Peruvian and Bolivian Amazon, which meant that the Peruvian government could charge whatever they wanted for it, and they got rich very fast. But what happened in Britain was that a lot of ministers got together and they said, we cannot pay this anymore. We absolutely refuse. So what did they do? They stole it. They put together an expedition and said to them, you're all experts. You're a gardener. You're an anthropologist. You speak Spanish. Get out there and steal this stuff. And they did. And so I started writing a book about that expedition. And this was really fortuitous because what I'd already done was start to write about a man who's turning to stone. I think I'd watch too much Doctor Who. But <laughs> this is one of the ways in which research um, often weirdly coincides with what you're already writing. I thought, right, I really want this man to get lost in a forest. And I want this forest to be big and huge. We don't have forests like that in England anymore. There's maybe one in Russia that would do, I was thinking about maybe the Congo or Borneo, but I don't know anything about the Congo or Borneo, and I don't want to go to the Congo because I'd die. So I was like, right, it's going to have to be the Amazon, isn't it? So I was thinking about the Amazon, and I wanted this man to be lost in this amazing forest. And then along comes that peculiar, boring monograph that I told you about. Markham wrote all about the geography and geology of his trip to Peru. He was on that expedition to steal quinine. And at that point, I went, oh, interesting. Peru, the Amazon, I'm having that. Marvelous. That was step one. But what, the reason I mentioned the man who turns to stone, this is kind of one of those remarkable moments that research just coincides with what you're writing anyway. There is a wonderful set of Peruvian fairy tales. And they are fairy tales. It's local folklore, and it still survives today. 
At the end of almost every single Peruvian fairy tale, a righteous man turns to stone. And I had no idea about that when I started to write this story about a man who turns to stone. What a coincidence. Again, stole all the rest of the folk tales. That's very useful. So this, all this stuff begins to pour into a book. I wrote a first draft, it was rubbish. I wrote a second draft, it was rubbish. I wrote a third draft. Finally, that was kind of more or less okay. And then I sort of thought, yeah, but you still don't know enough, do you? So I went to Peru. I got a travel grant. This is really good. There's a wonderful place um, in London called the Society of Authors, and they give writers grants to travel and to kind of do their research. So they gave me some money, so I went to Peru. And what I thought I was going to do was just, you know, learn Spanish and talk to some people. I thought it was just going to be like quite light level research. I thought I was just going to prove that, you know, I spoke Spanish and it would give me a bit of street cred. Great. That's not what happened at all. So I learned a bit of Spanish and then I started to go traveling in Peru. Now, I don't know how much you know about Peru, but a lot of it's very high up. I mentioned before that I'm from somewhere really flat, below sea level, actually. As soon as I go above about 8,000 feet, I get horrible altitude sickness. And when I say horrible, I mean like flat out on the floor, breathing with an oxygen canister. It's completely pathetic. But while I was there, while I was completely incoherent with altitude sickness, and by the way, it's the most amazing condition. How many of you have had altitude sickness? Yeah, it's disgusting, isn't it? You completely lose the ability to think. They call it altitude sickness, and I thought, oh yeah, okay, it'll just be a bit of nausea, I can cope with that. It'll be like, you know, seasickness, fine. Wrong. You completely lose the ability to think. You can't think in English or whatever your native language is, never mind in Spanish. I was completely helpless and sick on the floor of the hotel. Clever me. Actually, this was an incredibly lucky experience. Because in that monograph that Clements Markham wrote about that extraordinary trip to steal quinine in Peru, he mentioned that he got so altitude sick, he started getting very serious nosebleeds. And while I was on the floor of the hotel room, staring at the ceiling and wishing I could die, I went, this is great. Because what I realized was this would affect the entire plot of the novel. If you can't think properly, that hugely affects the decisions that you make. And one of the weird kind of big mysteries about his account as I'd read it was, why did they continue? It was really dangerous. They crossed the Andes, this real life expedition. They crossed the Andes and they crossed on a pass that was about 26,000 feet, incredible. And someone stopped them and threatened them. This man called Hernandez Martel stopped them and said, I will cut off your feet if you so much as touch a quinine tree. Did they listen? They did not. They carried on. Someone else threatened them. And this man followed them with a rifle. On the way, they also saw the body of a dead indigenous guide who had tried to help some British people steal this stuff before. So there was warning sign after warning sign. It was like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It was like the moment where they walk into that old petrol station and there's a woman with a pig's head on the counter and it's covered in flies. And what do they do? They still go in like morons. And I sort of went, why in the world would you continue on when there's a man with a rifle behind you saying he's going to cut off your feet? No, I'd go home. What's the drive here? And I thought, well, all these men were rich. They, they had no like, financial drive to do this. And I'm not convinced that anyone does anything that insane just for love of their country. Of course they don't. And now I'm back on the hotel room floor, dying again. And I went, it's this. They couldn't think. They were so altitude sick that they couldn't think around the idea that maybe they should go back. And that was something that I had as well. I was really, really sick, not, not just kind of physically sick, but altitude sickness is oxygen deprivation. So basically what it does is it gives you horrible panic attacks. It kind of feels like drowning without the water. You get incredibly frightened at nothing at all. I've never had panic attacks in my life. Didn't realize what was going on until too late. So on the floor, having a panic attack, great. But of course, this is what happened to Clements Markham and his expedition. I was lying there and I went, oh my God, I've got to go up again. I've got to go to Lake Titicaca, which is at 15,000 feet, bearing in mind that I was dead at 10,000 feet. So I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Tried to book a flight home, couldn't do it, just completely lost my head, just got on a bus anyway. 
this was stupid because you can die of altitude sickness. <laughs> Happily, I was fine. But looking back, when I tried to tell my mum what I'd done, she went, what were you doing? What were you thinking? Why did you get on that bus? And in the end, I just had to say, I literally couldn't think well enough to do anything else. I'd booked the bus ticket, so I had to go. And then I sort of went, oh yeah, that's what the Victorian expedition did, isn't it? That changed the entire novel, that realization. Like going there and doing it and getting that weird physical condition that these men had really helped. If I were an actor, this would be method acting, right? So I'm gonna call it method writing. Method writing is really useful. Go away, do the thing that you're talking about. I think um, very briefly in my lovely introduction, it was mentioned that uh, I also served as a deckhand on a tall ship. I did. This was also a stupid idea because I get really seasick as well. There's a pattern forming here, isn't there? Yeah, I'm not a very good traveler. The reason that I decided that I needed to sail on the ship was that I'd written another story at this point. I'd got sort of second or third draft of a story I really loved, and it's about a young lighthouse engineer. Whole can of worms in itself, but lighthouses had engineers in the 1900s because they ran on steam engines and generators and this kind of wonderful technology. Young engineer gets stolen by a Navy captain and pressed into naval service. I thought, right, okay, I've imagined this quite well so far, but I do not know what it's like to sail on a tall ship. I just don't. And what's really interesting is that sailing on a tall ship is not like sailing on a modern ferry. It's incredibly difficult for a start. Even just to work as an unqualified deckhand, you have to be really energetic, really strong, and you have to not care if you're being seasick over the side every 10 minutes, because you still have to do your job. On the first evening, even though my mum had specifically told me not to, I had to climb the mast and sort out some sails. And when I looked down, I was 60 feet off the deck, and it was really windy, and it was 10 o'clock at night on the North Sea, and it was freezing. And I sort of, there's a line that runs under the, the yard arm, which is the kind of cross across the mast. And I sort of went, this is amazing. I could die. I never get to nearly die. This is brilliant. And that solved another massive mystery for me, because one of the things that had really puzzled me when I was writing the book was, why did so many people sign up to be in the Navy in, say, 1870, 1880. It's a horrible profession, right? You're always freezing, you're always wet, and chances are you're going to be seasick all the time. Why would anyone in their right mind sign up to this? And I understood the answer at the top of this mast. It's because it's bloody brilliant. It's the best thing I've done in my life. You do something dangerous and interesting and useful, and then you come down and you carry on with your watch like normal. Amazing! I never get to do that. If you had signed up to naval service in the time that tall ships were sailing, that was your life. And it's an amazing life. And I went from a draft that was all about kind of being miserable on the ship and like, oh, isn't life difficult? And oh, isn't it gritty realism and rubbish? To joy. There was suddenly joy on the page where there just hadn't been before. Even though this guy has been kidnapped, even though the situation is horrible and the weather is terrible, I sort of went, you cannot but enjoy this because it's so extraordinary. So it's really worth writing what you can find out. Don't assume that you know. We hardly know anything. Go and do it. Go and talk to people. Go and go do something crazy. Go get altitude sickness. Go and climb Everest. Do whatever you need to do, but do it. Be adventurous, explore, and one day you'll be able to imagine well enough, and I can't do it yet, but I will, you'll be able to imagine well enough to do dragons. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, hopefully some of you have got some questions. This I would like, because I finished a little bit early. Please, somebody have a question. You can ask me anything. Not maths, I can't do maths. Yes, lady in the red dress. Do you just want to shout, is that okay? Okay, that's such a good question. Um, for those of you who didn't hear, the lady said, how do you know when you're done? 
There is no such thing as done with a novel. Uh, just all be aware of this right now. The moment that you're technically done is the moment that your editor pries the manuscript from your cold, dead hands. You never willingly hand over a novel. It's just your editor going, no, we literally have to print it now. Stop. Write something else. So that's how I know. That's, how, that's my, my editor going, yeah, leave it. You have to leave it now. The other way, before you're published, the way that you know you're finished is when you hate the novel, you hate all the characters, and you wouldn't care if you killed them on page five. When you're that tired of it, you're ready. <laughs> Are there other questions? Was there? Oh, in the purple t-shirt. Just yell, yeah. Okay, another really good question. Um, the gentleman asked, how do you start putting ideas on a page? I think one of the most intimidating things um, in all of our lives is a blank Word document, isn't it? A blank piece of paper, that's horrifying. So what I would suggest is never begin at the beginning. That's a terrible mistake to make. Very natural, but a terrible mistake to make. Partly because when you're writing a story, or even when you're thinking of a story, the things that you think of first are never kind of in chronological order. So for example, the, the Peru book that I was telling you about, which is this one here with the lovely cover, the beginning is set in a garden in Cornwall. But my first idea, as I told you, was about a man who gets lost in a forest and turns to stone. That was the first thing I wrote. That was the first kind of snippet that I got down on a page. I sort of went, right, I have to get this straight. I have to do this to write this. That scene does not appear until three quarters of the way through the book. Just put down what interests you. Later, you can arrange it into something that's novel-shaped. But the most important thing is just to write down the first thing that occurs to you. Get it down and then start expanding on it. Let it grow naturally rather than trying to force it into this kind of linear arrangement. Does that help? Hope so. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, at the back. I think there's a switch at the bottom of the microphone you have to turn on. Thank you. Uh, one of the interesting thing you mentioned just now is that when you are writing, you feel you only have like four productive hours for writing. Would you say that's um, like for yourself or there is kind of a patent for everyone? I think four hours is the amount that I can do, I can do comfortably. I definitely know other writers who can go for longer. But what I've noticed about, so everyone I know is a writer, it's exhausting. We're all very melodramatic and strange. But my friends who write for longer than I do tend to burn out much quicker than I do. So one of the really important things with writing is to not burn out. Because if you exhaust yourself and you run out of ideas really quickly after you know only writing for a week, it's not a thing that you can sustain. You then have three weeks not writing, and then you stop writing completely, and then you forget what your story was about. It's much more like marathon running. Don't try and sprint the whole thing. Try and keep a steady pace. Now, as you point out, my steady pace is different from other people's steady pace. It's probably slower because I'm really lazy and unfit. Some of you will be able to go for five hours. Some of you will only be able to go for half an hour at the start. But one of the big... Uh, mistakes that people make when they're just starting to write is they think, oh, I've not done enough if they've only written for 15 minutes. It's the same as running. At first, you, you don't run a marathon on your first try. You run for 10 minutes, and then the next day you run for 15 minutes, and then the next day you run for 15 minutes, but a little bit quicker and a little bit better, and you build it up and up and up. So, of course, your pace will be different to mine. Just find what you can do. Find where you can settle and do as much as you can every day, and then you'll, you'll hit a sustainable pace. Uh, yes, in the blue T-shirt, please. Yeah. Just bellow. It'll be fine. <laughs> Okay, okay, really good question. So the lady asked, what do you do when you get writer's block? Firstly, I would like to say to all of you, writer's block is a myth. It does not exist. What people say when they mean they've got writer's block, yeah, you all think you know better than me, but you don't. Right, what people say when, they, they, when they've got writer's block, what they think they mean, 
is that, you know, oh my God, I can't write anymore, or there's this terrible cement block in my brain. They don't mean that. What they actually mean is they can't finish writing the story that they're, finished, that they're trying to finish right now. The unfailing and perfect antidote to that is to have at least two or three stories on the go at once. Then what you can do is when you hit that wall with one story, and I always hit it annoyingly when the story is about 50,000 words long, so that's much too long to just discard, but it's definitely not a novel yet, so it just sits in that irritating stage for weeks. When that happens to me, do something else. I always have something else going on at the same time. I always write two novels at the same time. And it really helps. Try and write two different stories at the same time as well. It stops you going insane. When you can't continue with one, you start the other. When you can't continue with that one, you go back to the first one. And it's quite therapeutic because all your writing and plotting and style cogs are still going when you're writing the second one. And I honestly don't care if it's trash. Write whatever you want. Write fan fiction. Go away, watch... What do people like watching? Like Supernatural? Well, it's rubbish now, but watch Supernatural. Write Supernatural fan fiction and then come back and do your novel. Then do the novel till you're bored and then write the Supernatural fan fiction again. And honestly, I kid you not, one day the Supernatural fan fiction will evolve into a novel by itself. You just change the characters' names and lo and behold, you've got a novel. And don't imagine that there aren't people who've done that. Fifty Shades of Grey, yeah? It's Twilight fan fiction. Did you know that? Yeah, it definitely is. Christian Grey is Edward Cullen. Go away, read it. You'll see what I mean. It's really freaky. And now you won't be able to watch Twilight without thinking of like sex dungeons. I have ruined it for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, at the back. The lady asked if my family is supportive of what, my do of what I do. So my dad is very, very working class. Um, he... He always votes for Labour, which is the UK party for kind of poorer people. He's a fire-breathing socialist. He'd be very happy living in, in communist Russia. Um, and he thinks that for a job to be a real job, you have to suffer in order to do it. Your worth is measured in your suffering. <laughs> so he thinks it's, it's a proper job if you sit at a desk eight hours a day and you're miserable. He thinks it's a proper job if you strain your back on a building site. And when he realized that I was actually making a living writing, which is the easiest job in the world, because as we say, I only do it for four hours a day and the rest of the time I watch Netflix, or I do amazing stuff like this, the look on his face was one of such betrayal as I have never seen in my life. He was so disconcerted that it was possible to earn money doing basically nothing. <laughs> So he is supportive of it, but he doesn't understand. My mum is the storyteller in the family. She wrote amazing stories just for me when I was little. Um, she, she's fully supportive of it. She likes the idea of not suffering when you're working because she came from a slightly more middle-class background where that's okay. <laughs> um, and my brother is a... Um, He's a fashion designer, he's a tailor. So he's very much kind of in the creative industries as well. And he's the one who sort of sorts out all my plots when they go wrong. And he's, he's devastatingly honest. He sort of sits me down and he goes, you know, that's really boring, right? <laughs> These are the worst words that can come out of anyone's mouth when you've written a story for them. <laughs> but he does, he's shameless. And then my editor, who's a shark, goes, you're being so lazy, Natasha. She's a messed up South African. You're being lazy, Natasha. No. So this is, yeah, my family are very, very supportive, uh, apart from my very confused father. <laughs> um, I think, how are we for time? One last question? Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, in the hat. <laughs> So, I wish that what you just said was true. I wish that I'd written in like a, a sort of happy fairyland where I had all the time in the world. I didn't. I was stressed. I was unemployed. I was completely miserable. Um, I started getting like really hysterical and weird. The doctor went, you need to be on the pill. And I went, yeah, I do need to be on the pill. Um, so, it was just, it, it can be soul-destroying. And, and I think it's important to be honest about that and recognize that 
if you have this drive to do this almost impossible thing, you will be miserable for 90% of the time while you're trying to do it. And let yourself be miserable. That is character building, honestly. I mean, not too character building. I wouldn't recommend that you go out and do it for years and years. Like, just give up and get a PR job. It'll pay the money. But it's, it's definitely not roses before you're published. I think the worst year of my life was just before I was published. I was stuck at home. It was terrible. So no, no, it was awful. To just you know, get published as quickly as you can. That's how you make some money. And then nice people like the British Council go, oh, she's terribly important, you know. She's just like Joseph Conrad. She should come and speak at Hong Kong. It's like, Great. <laughs> okay, I think uh, one last question. Yes, gentleman in the T-shirt there. It, um, it really helps when you want to talk to people really honestly. I think English is a bit of a weird language to speak as your first language, right? Because it's kind of everybody else's second language. Everyone else has a really different relationship with English to how I do. I speak weird English. I speak a kind of... Uh, when I'm by myself with my brother, we speak this kind of weird slang, Fenland, unfashionable, stupid English. And then when you're away, you, have, you speak this kind of much more formal English, don't you? Like Often English is for business. It's the language of officialdom and law courts and textbooks, which means that people don't want to tell you anything interesting in English, do they? They, they, will, they will say to you, here is the menu, and they'll say this is the taxi that I've ordered for you. And you go, oh, yes, thank you very much. But, w but when you say, could you possibly tell me about, um, could you tell me a joke that you last heard at the pub because I think jokes are really important? Or can you tell me about the way you think about time? People just look at you like you're a weird little monkey and they're just like, get lost. I'm not telling you that. If you ask them in their own language, they tell you. If you say, let me take you out for a beer, and I want you to talk to me a little bit about you know, like time and stuff, they're like, oh, yeah. And the best thing that happened in Peru, I, I'm talking about time, because in Peru, um, indigenous people, Quechua people, have a really interesting view of the way that time works. And I'd read about this before I went out there, but I was sure it couldn't be true. So I was in Cusco, which is the, the old capital um, of Peru, the Inca capital, and it's it's still full of, of people who are the descendants of the Inca. It's full of Quechua people, and they are amazing weavers um, for reasons that you should look up. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, Inca writing was, used to, it was done on string and knots, so they remain astonishing weavers even today. Um, and I found this lady outside a hotel, and I was, I was like, um, can I talk to you? And she went, no, 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 no. <laughs> so I chased her around the hotel <laughs> like a freak. And I, I finally cornered her. I was like, I will buy 10 scarves if you tell me this thing. And she went, yeah, what is it? <laughs> and I said, can you tell me about time, like the way you talk about time? Which direction does time go? I was like, and I said, which way would you point if I said something was a really long time ago? And she went, a long time ago. And I said, point to next Tuesday. And she went, next Tuesday. That's really interesting for me. So I think anyone who has a kind of English as a first language will say, the future is ahead of you and the past is behind. And, and this is the way that all our time metaphors work, kind of time flows past a future. According to indigenous Quechua people, the future is there and the past is there. And the idea is that you're kind of standing backwards in the flow of time. It's really fascinating. Your ancestors have gone on beyond you. So, yeah, it's really difficult. It's not difficult to explain. I'm just making an absolute mess of it. It's really silly. So, the past is behind. Your ancestors are well ahead of you. They've already sailed on the river of time. They're going that way into the past. Your descendants have yet to come behind you. It's quite clever. But it means that when Quechua people speak to Spanish people about a coffee date next Tuesday, and the Spaniard is saying, oh, yeah, I'll see you on Tuesday, and the Quechua person is like, yeah, Tuesday. You're like, when? Sorry? What? Lots of time misunderstandings in Peru. It's huge fun. But that is just one example of something that you get 
for asking people things in their own language. Nobody would have told me that in English. Nobody would have been able to tell me that in English. I couldn't have even asked. And so I think go there, learn the language. It's a drag, it's, you know, it's difficult, you need lots of time. Um, you need a brain that's better than mine to actually remember anything, but it really is worth it. Thank you very much.